Anteaters, Armadillos, and Other Odd Animals by Maine Reed This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caroline Shapiro Anteaters, Armadillos, and Other Odd Animals by Maine Reed this is, perhaps, the most interesting of the groups. Interesting on account of the singular animals which compose it, every one of which may be termed an odd creature. In a strictly natural classification, these animals would not come together, since many of the species are unlike the others, both in appearance and habits. But in a scientific point of view, the absence of incisor teeth has caused them to be arranged together in a group known as the edentata, or toothless animals. In this group we shall give the first place to the true anteaters, and first speak of the anteaters of America. Of these there are four well-known species, the great ant bear, or tamanoir, the tamandua, or little ant bear, another little ant bear, the ring tamandua, and a very small species that differs much from the other three. They are all inhabitants of tropical America, and there are varieties of them in different districts. The tamanoir is by far the largest, often attaining the size of a Newfoundland dog, and the long hair which covers its sides, together with its immense bushy tail, give to it the appearance of being much bulkier than it is. Its habits are tolerably well known, constituting a very curious chapter in natural history, which we have not space to give. Suffice it to say that its food consists entirely of ants and termites which of themselves form a strange feature in the zoology of tropical countries. These it eats, not with teeth, but by means of its long slimy tongue, by which it is enabled to draw into its mouth hundreds of the little creatures at a time. The two species of smaller ant bears, or tamanduas, obtain their sustenance in a similar manner, and in other respects are like their great congener. But they possess a power with which the latter is not gifted, that of climbing trees, and making their nests high up in the cavities of the trunks. They have the further power of being able to suspend themselves from the branches with their tails, which, like those of the opossums, are highly prehensile. The tamanduas do not live solely upon ant diet. The wild bees that build nests among the branches are also objects of their attention, and their thick, hairy skins appear to protect them from the stings of these insects. The smallest species, called the watiri, or two-toed anteater, differs altogether from the three above mentioned. It more resembles a little monkey, and is covered all over with a thick coat of soft woolly hair of a yellowish color. It is also a tree climber, possesses a naked prehensile tail, and makes its nest in a hole in the trunk, or in one of the larger branches. In Africa, the anteaters are represented by several kinds of animals, differing essentially from each other in outward appearance, though all agreeing in their habits, or rather, in the nature of their food. The aardvark, or earth hog, of the Cape colonists is the most noted kind. This animal is a long, low-bodied creature with sharp-pointed snout and an immense whip-like tongue, which he is capable of projecting to a great distance, in the same manner as the tamanoir. His body is covered with a dense shock of reddish-brown hair, and he dwells in a burrow, which he can cleverly make for himself, hence his trivial name of Ground Hog. The other African anteaters are usually called pangolins, or manis. These are covered with scales that resemble suits of ancient armor, and on this account they have sometimes been confounded with the armadillos, though the two kinds of creatures are altogether different in their habits. The pangolins possess, in common with the armadillos, the power of rolling themselves into a ball whenever attacked by an enemy, a fashion not peculiar to pangolins and armadillos, but also practiced by our own well-known hedgehog. The sloths belong to this group of mammalia, not that they have the slightest resemblance to the anteaters in any respect, but simply, as before stated, because they want the cutting teeth. They are not absolutely toothless, however, since they possess both canines and molars. With these they are enabled to masticate their food, which consists of the leaves and tender shoots of trees. The name sloth is derived from the sluggishness of their movements, amounting almost to complete inactivity. 
they scarce stir from the spot in which they may be placed or at all events move so slowly as to be a whole hour in getting from one tree to another or even from one limb to another they spend most part of their time upon the trees the cecropia peltata is their favorite usually clinging to the branches with their backs downward and in this way they crawl from one to another uttering at intervals a plaintive cry which resembles the syllable i uttered several times in succession from this they derive one of their trivial names of i or i i the sloths are all inhabitants of tropical america dwellers in the great forests of guiana and brazil as natural curiosities in the animal kingdom the armadillos do not yield to any of the four-footed creatures and an account of their habits would space permit could not be otherwise than extremely interesting they are exclusively inhabitants of america but many species both in north and south america are found far beyond the limits of the torrid zone there are a great many species known and these are of all sizes from that of an ordinary rat to the giant tattoo which sometimes attains the enormous dimensions of a moderate sized sheep it may be mentioned that they are subdivided into a number of genera as the sloths etc and here again without any very sufficient reason since they all possess the scaly armor from which the name armadillo is derived and their habits are nearly identical they dwell in burrows which they make for themselves in fact they are more than ordinarily clever at excavating and have been blamed for carrying their tunnels into graveyards and feeding upon the bodies there deposited of some of the species this charge is but too true and one would think that an animal of such habit would be regarded with disgust on the contrary the flesh of the armadillo is in much esteem as an article of food both among the white colonists and the natives and men and dogs are employed in many parts of south america to procure it for the table several species of armadillos possess the power of cluing themselves up a la hedgehog and thus presenting an impenetrable front to the attacks of an enemy while others want this power but in its stead can flatten their bodies along the ground in such a way that neither dog nor jaguar can set tooth upon anything softer than their scales and these are as impenetrable as if they were plates of steel the more noted species are known by different names as the tattoo poyu the giant tattoo the piba the pichisiego the pichi the hairy tattoo the mataco the apara and such like designations it may be added that the armadillos dwell in districts very dissimilar according to the species they inhabit low marshes thick forests or dry open hills and several kinds are indigenous to the high tablelands of the andes their usual food consists of fruits, legumes, and roots, but they are nearly all omnivorous and will eat carrion whatever it falls in their way. To this group belong two very singular animals that have only of late years become known. These are the mullingong, better known as the ornithorhynchus, and the echidna, or ant-eating hedgehog. Both are natives of what may be termed the New World of Australasia. To give an account of the peculiar conformation or appearance of the mullingong would require many pages, and only the artist can convey any idea of what the creature is like. Suffice it to say that it is a sort of triangular cross between a bird, a quadruped, and a fish, having the bill of a duck, the hair, skin, and legs of a quadruped, and the aquatic habits of a fish, or rather of a seal. In general appearance it is, perhaps, more like to a beaver than to any other animal. It dwells upon the banks of rivers, lakes, or marshes, burrows in the ground like a badger, swims and dives well, and feeds chiefly on aquatic insects. The echidna is altogether a different sort of creature, both in appearance and habits. It is, in reality, an anteater with the body of a porcupine, having a long, slender snout and an extensile tongue, just like that of other anteaters. It burrows in the ground where it can remain for a long period without food, and it is supposed to issue forth only during the season of the rains. It also possesses the power of rolling itself into a ball like the hedgehog, hence its name among the colonists of ant-eating hedgehog, but by far the most appropriate appellation for it is the porcupine anteater, since in general appearance it is exceedingly like several species of porcupines. The porcupines and hedgehogs 
though usually classed elsewhere on account of their teeth, their food, and a few other reasons not very natural, should certainly stand in this group of odd animals, and here let us place them. We have not space to say much about either of them, and can only remark of the porcupines that there are nearly a dozen known species inhabiting different parts of the world, as usual separated into a great number of genera. Europe, Asia, Africa, the Asiatic Islands, North and South America all have their porcupines, some of them entirely covered with quills, others with hair intermingled with the spines, and still others on which the spinous processes are so small as to be scarcely perceptible yet all partaking of the habits and character of the true porcupines. It may be further remarked that the American porcupines are tree climbers and feed upon twigs and bark, in fact lead a life very much resembling that of the sloths. The hedgehogs about which so much has been said should also go with this group, though it is usual to place them among carnivorous animals. Of hedgehogs there are also several species, and they are found in most countries of Europe and in many parts of Asia and Africa. No true hedgehog has yet been discovered in North or South America, but they have their representatives there in other species of worm-eating animals. It would not be proper to conclude these sketches without remarking that there are still a few other odd animals which we have not an opportunity of introducing here. As an instance, we may mention the little daman, or hyrax, a native of Africa and Asia Minor, and of which there are two or three distinct species. This is the animal over which Monsieur Frederick Cuvier and other learned anatomists have raged such a paean of triumph. Having discovered that, notwithstanding its great resemblance to a rabbit, the little creature was, in reality, a rhinoceros. Monsieur Cuvier and his followers seem to have omitted the reflection that this wonderful discovery very naturally suggests. Putting it interrogatively, we may ask, how is it that the hyrax, whose anatomical structure proves it to be a rhinoceros, is not a rhinoceros in habits, appearance, nor, in fact, in anything but the shape of its bones. If, then, we were to take osteology for our guide, I fear we should often arrive at very erroneous conclusions. And were the little hyrax an extinct animal and not known to us by actual observation, we should be led by anatomical theorists to ascribe to the timid creature a very different set of manners from what it has got. Despite anatomic theories, then, we shall continue to regard the hyrax, the coney of the scriptures, as a rabbit and not a rhinoceros. End of Anteaters, Armadillos, and Other Odd Animals by Maine Reed Recording by Caroline Shapiro, Oakland, California, USA